Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We are in the middle of studying the life of Christ, looking at the various episodes, the various stories as they come up. Ken, what is the episode first this session? Okay, just to give us an overall picture, if you take the Gospel of John and you work out the chronology of the life of Christ, his ministry lasted about three and a half years. Uh, the first year and a half we know very little about. In the first six months he was baptized, he had the temptations, he had the w wedding in Cana, he, he healed the man's son, and that was, that's about how much we know about the first six months. The second six months, we are ready to start now. It started with the, with the Passover, where he went down to Jerusalem. And if you would like to follow along with us, you need to turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And we'll start approximately with, with verse 13. Um, we will not have time, of course, to read the whole episode. But Jesus went down there, and as you know, he walked into the temple. He walked around for a while. He looked around for a little while. Then he said, you know, picked up a small cord, and he said, get this stuff out of here. And um, just to finish the overall picture, he spent about a year between that Passover and the following Passover working more or less quietly around to Judea. Um, at the end of that period of time, John the Baptist was arrested, and things were getting very difficult for Jesus, so he took his disciples and went to Galilee. The next year he spent ministering in Galilee. At the end of that year, um, he decided it was time. Actually, John, at the end of that year, John the Baptist was beheaded. And Jesus says, okay, the time has come for me to move on with the next part of my ministry. He took his disciples to territory, Gentile territories, away from Galilee, away from Judea, and spent approximately six months really focusing on training his disciples. Then, in the last six months of his ministry, <clears throat> in the last six months of his life here on this earth, he came back to Galilee, spent most of his time on the other side of the Jordan River in Perea, a, a more or less Gentile territory, but a lot of Jews also lived over there. And it was easy for the Jews to go over there to hear what Jesus said. And he basically repeated much of his teaching that he had done previously in Galilee. At the same time, he was, make, he was you know, letting people all over the place know who he was, making very strong statements about his mission, etc., etc., in preparation for the time when he was going to go up to Jerusalem to, for that final Passover week and the crucifixion. So that's an overall picture. And so now we're going to go back to the end of the first six months of his ministry to the first Passover being discussed in the Gospel of John. And he went into the temple, as you know. He picked up that small cord and he didn't use that to do any damage to anybody, I'm sure. But he started through there. And remember that at the temple, there's a, there's a most holy place, there's a holy place, and there's a small courtyard in Herod's temple around those two areas. There was an inner place that was only for Jewish males, a slightly large area surrounding that where Jewish females were allowed to go. And then there was a huge courtyard outside of that that was originally supposed to be the courtyard for the Gentiles. But of course the Jews figured the Gentiles had no business being there anyway because they couldn't be saved or hardly be saved. And so they had turned that Gentile court into a marketplace. And that's where Jesus is here telling them to get out. And we're going to ask you to think with us about a part of these stories that perhaps you haven't thought about before. We have suggested many times in our times together here that the purpose of Jesus come, well, the whole purpose of the Bible is to tell, some, tell us something about God. And here's God in person, alive on this earth, ministering to 
groups of people, large and small, and surely he has something really important to say to us about his father, about all the members of the Godhead, and so forth, and about our salvation. So we're going to ask questions like, why, what is Jesus trying to say to us about God through this experience? We need to recognize at the same time that there's a devil out there who's very busy. And he is absolutely determined to prevent Jesus from getting his message across. And he's going to tempt Jesus in every way he can possibly think of. He's going to try to defeat his purpose in every way he can possibly think of. So the devil, we're going to think about what, what is, what's the devil doing here? What, what, how does he look at this experience? And then we're going to try to say, okay, what is Jesus trying to say specifically to the Jewish people in light of their understanding of what the Messiah was supposed to do, which was false, as we know, but in light of what they thought the Messiah was going to do. And then what is, what is the devil going to do to try to promote those other views? So I'm going to ask you to really put your thinking caps on as, as we look at these stories. So here's Jesus with his hand up and his small cord, and he's driving people out of the temple. What's going on? What? What do you think he's trying to say to us? Well, it says, and drove all of the animals yes. out of the temple. Yes. He did that? Yeah. That's not all he did. No, but, but uh, that seems to be the, the focus of his ire at the moment. Yes. Not, it's not, not the people. Yeah. Okay. So, do you, and why do you think he's driving the animals out of the temple? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure he found it very disrespectful. That was the merchandise. Yeah, yeah. That was the merchandise that they were trying to sell to people for, for the purpose of offering sacrifices. And he's trying to say this temple is supposed to be for this area of the temple. Let's be very specific. It's supposed to be for what? Gentiles. The Gentiles. The Gentiles. And why, what are the Gentiles supposed to be doing there? Learning about God. Learning about God, about the purpose of the whole ceremonies, the whole thing, what they can learn about God. And what's actually happening? It's a marketplace now. It's a marketplace with a lot of noise and people changing coins. You can't buy any of those animals without changing your money, whatever it is, to the temple, to the temple shekel. And you got ripped off a big time when you tried to exchange for the temple shekel. And then you went to buy your animals, the animals inside the temple courtyard which were supposed to be all prepared just right for sacrificing, and they were 10 or 15 times as expensive as the ones right outside the gate. And so those are the kind of things you need to be aware of in looking at this story. So why didn't they get the ones right outside the gate? Why didn't they well, get the animals right outside the gate? Because they weren't allowed to bring them in. That was controlled by the Sadducees. But wouldn't they try to find one hair that was the wrong color or, or some little thing. Yeah. You can't sacrifice this animal. You have to use one, and we happen to have one here for you that you can buy that'll, yeah. that'll work for your sacrifice. Yeah, and it, it's my understanding that uh, some of those expensive animals weren't sacrificed. They were kind of taken in and run around through. Recycled. The, that's right. Yeah, and I don't know it's how true that possible. is. But. Quite possible. But now, Think about this. You have a huge marketplace. There, there have been estimates that, that at Passover time, up to two million Jews would show up to, to come to the temple. On, so there's this huge crowd of people, all these animals, a huge marketplace. Try to imagine yourself in the biggest open market you've ever seen in your life, and Jesus raises a cord and everybody runs. My understanding is the, the children weren't afraid of him, though, when he did that. That, that happened the second time. Second time we'll we'll okay. get to that in a moment. At the very end of his life, just about three or four days before he was actually crucified, he did the same thing over again, which is interesting because after this experience, Ellen White tells us that the Sadducees and the Pharisees sat down, why did we run? I, why did we allow him to get away with this? We will never allow him to do this again. We will make absolutely sure that he cannot do this again. They ran just as fast the next time. <laughs> and that's my question. What, why did they run? That was the first stock market. Okay. You know, real if real they, what stock. What was on the stock market, that was it right there. Not only stock market, but stock yard. Stock, stock yard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe vestiges of a conscience here and there. Vestiges of a conscience? 
Okay, but you know, I can look at you and you don't run. I mean, and I, obviously I can't make you guilty, I guess, maybe. But what does this story say about God? Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to get well, to. I think it says at least one thing, that he is trying to correct uh, uh, an error in their, in their thinking mm -hmm. that this place that he ordered to be built was to be built was for a totally different purpose than what they were using it for and he was trying to so it looks it makes God look good that he's trying to get things back to the original uh, purpose for which it was made. Exactly the original command to Moses I mean I'm sorry to Abraham was you know, you're supposed to be a blessing to all nations and then the prophets repeatedly said these temples are supposed to be for the blessing of all nations and so forth. So, first of all, Jesus is trying to straighten out their worship, right? Yeah. And he's trying to prevent the ripoff that was being done by the Sadducees who controlled the marketplace in the temple. But why is he trying to do that? So what, what does it say about God? Well, suppose that, suppose that you came to church and someone standing at the front, the guy who's welcoming you in church says, uh, $50, please. <clears throat> and when you get inside, the pastor says, you can only sit down in the pew if you have another hundred dollars. And, and what would you be inclined to say? I think I'll go to the church next door. Right, exactly. <clears throat> or not even bother to Maybe go. up on the hill, up in the, up in the grove. <laughs> no, exactly. What they were doing is misrepresenting God. That's a, that whole priesthood yeah. system was just all uh, perverse. And uh, that pain Jesus the most, I believe. To Do you, what it says about God is that he didn't give up on that system. He is still trying to correct it. Yeah. And if you had just been ripped off two or three times trying to get in there to offer your sacrifice, what are you going to be thinking about as you're, as you're offering your lamb there? Well, the, the, the lack of weight in my billfold. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're going to be thinking about getting ripped off. You're not going right. to be thinking about, boy, I'm so glad I came here to worship God in this quiet place with plenty of chance to meditate, etc. Are you? No. And you may have some bitterness against the priest yeah. because here you are with a sincere heart. You've went down there and you've brought your money, but you feel ripped off somehow. Well, um, and one probably might have a little animosity someone might have an animosity toward God for requiring yeah. so much, uh, you know, why, you know, and, and a lot of people truly believe that, and they, <clears throat> it was more than just a sacrifice of an animal, animal, it was a sacrifice of, you know, school books they needed for their children, for example, yeah. or health care for their family would be a, a modern comparison in order to yeah. come in and appease this, this God that expected all of this stuff. Well, one other thing that happened at that first Passover visit, the one other thing that's, that's documented in some length, is one of the members of the Sanhedrin heard Jesus talk a couple of times and he said, this guy has something. He's not like anybody else we've ever heard from in this temple. I need to, I need to talk to this man. Yes. Before you go on. Okay. <laughs> I, in, in, in this story, do, do I detect that God has a way of communicating to people that humans may not have a way of communicating? It's when he, well, mm -hmm. when he supposedly raised his voice and they all ran, uh, is, is, is there, is it the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, turned up their sensitivity uh, and uh, they, they, they felt uh, picked on or... Uh, now, this, this, this almost comes across some kind of a temper tantrum. Some would well, say, you know, is having a temper it tantrum is. here. Ellen White uses the term divinity flashed through humanity. What do you think happened? But didn't when Christ was 12 in the temple, mm -hmm. awe the Pharisees and the, the teachers there and he was 12. I mean, he mm. was just... He asked good questions. Yeah. I mean, and they knew at that time there was something special about this boy. You know, there's certain people that have a countenance about them, and I'm not saying that there wasn't divinity involved here, but you kind of go, okay, I'll listen to you. Mm -hmm. They just have a way of 
but that listening and having respect and, and saying, wow, that's interesting, I'll listen, is a little different than running. What, why did they run? Now, Ellen White also says, excuse me for quoting repeatedly from Desire of Ages, but she also says that Jesus never used his divinity for his own benefit. That means he didn't do this just to show off. It also means that, and, and she says that the Father worked through him and did what, and basically performed his miracles for him, which means that who else could do that if we had the same kind of relationship? We could do that. If we had that kind of relationship with God and we were really trying to do his will. But don't you think that the Holy Spirit could have put his finger on the on the sore point in their conscience absolutely that that he woke something up in them that they were trying to keep smothered uh, yeah you know we could say they saw fire in his eyes or whatever I don't know what they saw but they were not standing around they also probably realized immediately that they were doing something very vile Mm -hmm. and wanted to get out of there. They, they, they knew that all along, but they had never had anyone with authority say, you know, you're doing, what you're doing is wrong. Weren't there uh, uh, policemen type people here? Weren't there temple guards? And There were some temple guards employed by the Jews, I don't know how many, but there were also around the outsides and probably in the court of the Gentiles, Roman guards. And the, Ro the Rome had built the Fortress, Fortress Antonio, I think they called it, right beside the temple and built it up high enough so they could sit up there in their guard towers basically and look down in the temple see what was going on. The Jews were not happy about that. but So I, I guess where I was going with this is, you know, isn't there some kind of a security that we could hear that one was supposed to come I, in and, and break up any, anything like that? I can assure like you that if the security had been there, they would be running too. <laughs> Question. Just knowing how politics works today in schools and cities, and um, if we wanted to do something in Loma Linda with the academy, and we were going to go on public land to do that, there would be an issue. Could this have been, and I don't want to <laughs> play devil's advocate here. Yeah, that's one of the things we need to do. Well, could they have not gone into this with the right intention? You know, we can't use, we've got all these people coming in and we've got all this stock and, and animals. We'll just use this area this time. And then it was, well, and that worked time, out really well, time, so let's do that again. And they knew it was wrong, but yet... It was too profitable to give up. Yeah. Well, maybe there weren't any Gentiles coming. Kind of well, like a temporary uh, tax increase. Mm -hmm. Only temporary, though. Yeah. We have temporary tax increases on the books that have been there for 70 years or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to move on because there's a lot of stories. We don't have time to, we can take a lot of time on each story. Who was it that wanted to see Jesus and when did he want to talk to Jesus? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And what do we know about Nicodemus? Well, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, wasn't he? He was a member of the Sanhedrin. What else do we know about him? He was a Pharisee. These were Jesus' bitterest enemies, okay? But he saw something, and he said, I need, to, I need to meet with this guy and find out what he's up to. And what did he do? He snuck around, he did it in the dark. He probably <laughs> had someone else go make the arrangements for him, with, considering his, situ, his, his level of authority. Good. Probably had someone, in, now imagine God here, Jesus Christ is here. And one of the leaders of the Jewish people sends someone else to see him and said, um, I would be embarrassed to talk to you in public. You know, I, I would be embarrassed to talk to God in public. Would you be willing to see me at night? Of course, he probably didn't say that so overtly. He was <laughs> thinking that. But. Should, should we draw a conclusion here, maybe a partial conclusion, that Nicodemus might have been a little straighter than some of his cohorts? Absolutely. He was obviously thinking this over. Yeah. Well, and again, but he wasn't the only one. No, there were a there, lot. There of There was a thinking. group of people, even in the in the Sanhedrin, who who were kind of afraid to go after Jesus because mm -hmm. 
it reminded them of going after the prophets and how their how their forefathers had persecuted the prophets and this man was doing these things and it looked an awful lot like a prophet and they were afraid they might be doing something bad yeah if you're asking what does this say about God mm -hmm. it, it looks as if God was not offended to be approached in such a uh, let's say defensive or, or secretive way okay you want to meet with me I'll, I'll meet with you yeah. uh, and Nicodemus comes with his royal robes on basically and we, pomp and he, he quietly comes there uh, maybe he took off some of his finery so not so many people would recognize him as he rode, walked through the streets and he comes to Jesus with this pompous expression look at John 3 there was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees one night he went to Jesus and said to him rabbi now rabbi means what teacher sure. teacher a not respected a a yeah. very respected teacher. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent by God. He's, he's sort of buttering him up here a little. No one could perform the miracles you're doing unless God were with him. And Jesus says, thank you for that nice greeting. Uh, what can I do for you? What did Jesus say? Quote, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Uh, Does that sound Cut like to the chase. Cut to the chase. <laughs> now, I'll, I'm sure we don't have this complete conversation. It will be, someday we'll get to see it. I believe in heaven we'll be able to see these things in 3D, living color. We'll hear the rest of the story. But John recorded this much. Straight to the, to the heart of the matter. You know, you, you can't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Nicodemus is caught completely off guard, and he says, what kind of ridiculous stuff is this? You know very well a probably, man. Probably thought he was already part of the kingdom of God. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm, you know, I'm already there. Yeah, exactly. I'm it. <laughs> yeah. Desire of Ages. Instead of recognizing this salutation, Jesus bent his eyes upon the speaker as if reading his very soul. Mm -hmm. In his infinite wisdom, he saw before him a seeker after truth. Mm -hmm. He knew the object of this visit, and with a desire to deepen the conviction all resting upon his listener's mind, he came directly to the point. Do you think, that was Desire of Ages page? 168. Do you think it's possible that back in the courtyard a few days earlier, when he looked at those people in the marketplace, they realized he was reading their souls. Well, they acted like it. <laughs> <laughs> they act, I think he they, was. They acted right. like it. And they did. knew he was. Yeah. They, he had one look at them and boy, they were on their way. It was very similar uh, as the story with, at, the lady, at the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very similar. She similar. Had, she That's, that story's coming up next. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, Nicodemus started with his sarcastic response, and then Jesus doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't, he could have responded with some kind of sarcastic thing back. He doesn't. He just says, I'm telling you the truth, replied Jesus, that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. A person is born physically of human parents and so forth, but if you're born of the Spirit, you're born from above. Is Nicodemus recognizing immediately these analogies, talking about the water and the Spirit? Well, the Jews did occasionally baptize con new converts. So, of course, Nicodemus thought he was way, way, way beyond that. Yeah. And then Jesus says those words, you are a great teacher in Israel and you don't know this? <laughs> you know, Jesus being just a little bit you know, he, he was chiding him a little bit to realize that, you know, you may be a member of the Sanhedrin, but you don't know everything. In fact, the things you, spoke, you thought you knew that you really ought to know, you apparently don't know. He was a strict Pharisee and prided himself in his good works. He was widely esteemed for his benevolence and his liberality in sustaining the temple service. And he felt secure in the favor of God. He was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in his present state. Exactly, exactly. So uh, now we're seeing a very big, we're starting to see a big gap between what they thought, their way of thinking, and their understanding of how people are saved, 
and what Jesus is trying to present. Okay? I, I guess again we need to ask, but what what does it say about God? Mm -hmm. What what Okay, first of all, God realizes he's willing to step down. If you want to meet God in the middle of the night, under any circumstances, whatever those circumstances are, God is right there. And he's Jesus there. probably had a pretty busy schedule that day. Yes, yes. This it, is Passover. It, it says he really doesn't care how rotten you get. If you want to come back, he's there. And he went on, and one of the next things he said just a few moments later, according to the record we have, was the famous verse John 3.16. For God loved the world so much. And what did Nicodemus think? Well, yeah, I know he loves Jews, right? Yeah. What did Jesus say? God loves the world so much that, that he gave his only son that who that everyone, my version says, that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Nicodemus, you need to expand your vision, right? What do you think the devil thought as he listened to that story, that, that experience? He was right there, watching. Any idea? God, you're not fair. <laughs> okay. Why, why would he say that? I said, look at, look at all the, what these people are doing, and you're going you're gonna to let them redeem them or, mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. restore them? You're going you're gonna to mess with these people who obviously are so mixed up in their understanding of everything? Yeah. Was he a little jealous of that? Absolutely. Satan. He's waiting for his chance. Insanely, insanely jealous. He was, he was here. These people were, were terrible, and he was terrible, but they were getting second and third you, chances. Do you think the devil ever wished that he could appear in person and contradict Jesus? Well, he probably could, but... He sort of cuts off the awesome. conversation pretty short, though, doesn't he? <laughs> he says, get behind me, Satan, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. You know. He said that more than once, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he yeah. didn't. Yeah. Go away, whatever. Well, he'll, he will be trying to foster whatever would foster selfishness in Nicodemus. Yeah. Right. I mean, he would be pushing the, you're going to lose your position, right. you're going to lose your money, you're going to, you're going to be in a deep mess if you get hooked up with this guy. Once again, if you believe and understand the writings of Ellen White, she says, when Nicodemus proclaimed himself a Christian at the, at, the, at the death of Christ and came out there to help bury him, etc., he officially joined the Christian church and he died a very poor man because he basically gave his entire wealth to the Christian church. Mm. Yeah. Satan loses. Satan loses. Yeah. Well, it's interesting what, what Jesus talks about next. He talks about the judgment. Look at uh, John three seventeen, And why, I mean, why would Jesus, he goes straight to this, do you think? For God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. And who is Jesus talking about? All the world, all of well, humanity. But uh, the Savior, who is the Savior he's talking about? God sent his son. Who's talking about? Himself. Why didn't he say, God didn't send me into the world? To be all inclusive so he wouldn't offend some, perhaps, okay. that he could what have if, What if Jesus had right there had said to Nicodemus, well, I'm the Messiah. You know, what do you need to know? I'll straighten it out. We're going to have to ask, answer that question when we get back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stand by, stay with us. We were discussing about Jesus and Nicodemus, and in John 3, verse 17, he says these somewhat startling words, for God did not send his son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. And we asked, why didn't Jesus said, <clears throat> say to Nicodemus, plain, you know, God didn't send me, you know, I'm God, why didn't he? and I came down here to do this work. I think Nic Nicodemus would have, that would have been even maybe too much for Nicodemus to swallow right at that point in time. It was very few times in the whole ministry of Jesus that he said things like that, and it was usually to people that were non-Jews that he yes. said it. So what did, what did Nicodemus understand the words, his son, to be? Well, I think he went home and thought about that a lot. Well, he goes on, those who believe in the son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged. And what do you think Nicodemus is thinking about his friends in the Sanhedrin, the people in the, in the church, in, in the, at the temple, the, all the people who gathered at, at, uh, for, for Passover at that time? He's, Jesus is saying, hmm, everyone, no one who believes in me, what does it say? Those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. R RSV uses, instead of the word judge, he uses the word condemn uh -huh. or condemned. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <clears throat> this is how the judgment works, Jesus says. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. People love the darkness rather than the light. And Nicodemus is asked to have an interview with Jesus in what kind of condition? <laughs> darkness. In darkness. I wonder what Nicodemus thought when Jesus said that. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Well, uh, there are so many things I, I'm tempted to say some more, but we need to go, I think, next to the story of the, the woman, the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. You know that the, Jesus decided, now, if you could picture in your mind, Judea is down here, and Galilee is up here, almost straight north, and in between is Samaria. And Jesus wants to travel to somewhere, let's see if I do it right, yeah, somewhere this side, if, the way you're looking at it, somewhere to the west, the northwest of, I'm sorry, the southwest of Galilee. So the shortest way from Jerusalem to the southwest of Galilee would be which way? Through Samaria. Straight through Samaria. And why didn't the Jews go that way all the time? Because they hated the Samaritans. Contamination. Yeah, and the Samaritans didn't feel too friendly to them either, did they? So instead, they would go down all the way to Jericho, cross the Jordan, travel all the way up on the east side through Perea, finally get clear up to Galilee, cross the Jordan River again, and, and on into Galilean territory. Long way around. But what did Jesus do with his disciples? I, I, I suspect, now this is not the twelve. He hasn't called anybody yet, but there were some following him. And so he says, let's go. And he just started right off for Samaria. And what do you think the disciples said? Oh, hey, babe. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Ta but I mean, would you dare to say, ask, question Jesus why he's heading for Samaritan territory? Well, he gets there. And he well, they didn't know that he. They didn't recognize that he was God. So sure, they could question him. Yeah, why not? But still, he was the rabbi. He was the teacher. So you had to be careful. Probably concerned about their own reputations too when people found out they'd gone through there. Mm -hmm. Well, they got to Sychar, which is sort of out in the middle of Samaritan territory, where there's a well. And they had walked through the heat of the day, and it was very warm. And they looked for some water. And what was the problem with the well? Deep. It was deep. It was deep. I've had the privilege of going by there and drinking some water out of that well. Uh, very nice water. It's still there. still works. But it's deep. And they didn't have any way of drawing. And what happened? Well, the disciples went off to town to see if they could buy some food. And they probably were thinking how they're going to buy food without contaminating themselves. But uh, they went off to buy some food, and then what, what, what happened? The Samaritan woman came to the well. Okay, and why was she coming in the middle of the day? 
because that's when no one else was around and she could, uh, with her bad reputation, she could be there and not be disturbed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same same reason as Nicodemus came at night. It was a good good way to to not be observed by. Him. Okay. Or she wasn't coming. She didn't know she was going to run into Jesus yeah. as as Nicodemus. Yeah. Did. She uh, was probably the center of most of the gossip of town. <laughs> yeah, and, probably. And uh, coming when the other ladies of the town were not at the well would be the safest. Yes. She might have been rebuffed physically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a reputation like hers. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know absolutely for sure that everybody in town knew about her reputation, but it's likely they knew at least something. They probably would have thrown stones at her. That wasn't that the customary yeah. practice. Go yeah. away, throw stones. Yeah. So she came to get her water, and she had this conversation with Jesus. And what did Jesus say to her that would be somewhat shocking to a Jew if he'd said it to him, to them. Shocking to a Jew or shocking to her? Well, shocking to a Jew, but surprising to her. Oh, that he, he had asked her to uh, fetch him or retrieve some water from the well for him, for a drink. And? Well, the thing is, the Jews didn't speak with the Samaritan. Samaritans and the Samaritans Conversely, but the disciples went into town to buy food. They would have to talk to Samaritans to buy food. That, that's different. That's a man. This is a Samaritan no. woman. And it's a marketplace situation. To trade with the Samaritans in case of necessity was indeed counted lawful by the rabbis. Don't, don't, pass, it, don't pass up a, an opportunity to make a buck. Okay. <laughs> well, there's only one thing more unclean than a Samaritan, and that's a, a woman. Well, what about the Gentiles? They're probably even worse. Yeah, they're pretty now, How bad. did she know he was Jewish? Well, by the way he was dressed. Probably the way he talked. But there's a key part of the conversation that I think we sometimes overlook, but are very important. She's, Jesus said to her, and I'm looking at, at chapter 4, verse 21, John, Believe me, woman, the time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship, but we jo Jews uh, know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. But the time is coming and is already here when by the power of God's Spirit, people will worship the Father as He really is, offering Him the true worship that He wants. God is Spirit and only by the power of His Spirit can people worship Him as he really is. That, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah will come, and when he comes, he will tell us everything. And Jesus answered, I am he. I who am talking with you. Do you think he would have dared to say that to Nicodemus? No. Why not? Why not? Because Nicodemus and the Jews had such a completely different version of what they thought the Messiah was all about. I, don't, I, don't, I think Jesus would say, if, if, I, if I say to Nicodemus that I'm the Messiah, he'll say, well, where's your, where's your sword and where's your crown and where's your horse? He, Nicodemus thought he was worth something and this woman thought she was worth nothing. Yeah. The Jews had so many misconceptions about what the Messiah was going to be what he was going to look like, what he was going to do, that Jesus just didn't fit any of those things. The Samaritans and the Gentiles didn't have all those preconceived ideas, yeah. and they were more open to what the Messiah would be. So Jesus tells this woman that he's the Messiah, and what does the woman do? Drops everything. She forgets about everything and heads for town. Of course, Jesus told her, you know, uh, go and get your husband, and she, she says, I don't have a husband, and he says, oh, that's right, you have had five. She said, um, <laughs> I think it's time for me to leave. <laughs> and she went to town, and what did she say? She told everyone she met the Messiah. The Messiah's out there, he knows everything about me, come and see Well, but yourself. I don't think that's exactly what, he sa what she said. She says, come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done. And then she asked, could he be the Messiah? Could he be the Messiah? Okay. To me that indicates that 
that she was yearning mm -hmm. for the Messiah. Yeah. Your question, what does this story say about God? Yes. You going to answer it? No, I've answered a couple. I'm going to let somebody else do it. I think the same thing. Every, every story, uh -huh. the answer, uh, we find the answer in the previous chapter, John 3.16. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple answer. It's one word, love. Mm -hmm. he, loved the Jew, he loved the Gentiles so much, he wanted to preserve their place in the temple. <coughs> he loved the, peop the Jews so much, he didn't want them wasting their money, being defrauded by purchasing unblemished uh, livestock inside the temple. He, you know, every, every story, he loves us, he wants to, he's patient with us. He reminds me of a parent whose never-ending love to their baby will always change their diaper. Mm -hmm. The sad part is I think that we are the infants and it's our diaper that needs changing every day. Mm -hmm. he, he, uh, he comes looking for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But Jesus is saying something more here. Remember what he said to Nicodemus? God so loved the world. Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the world, meaning everyone. The world. And now what is he doing? Showing He's it. demonstrating that. He's saying, here I am, and Samaritan territory, I know you Jews feel really un uneasy about this whole thing, and what did he do? He, he just stirred up enough interest in this woman. So she went roaring to town. She didn't draw any water. She left her pitcher there. I don't know whether Jesus used it while, he, while she was gone. I don't know. And pretty soon what happened? The whole town was out there to see what, what kind of a guy this was out there. At the That's, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's an interesting <clears throat> remark because that picture to carry that water, that was like, so valuable, mm -hmm. so valuable, because the water was their number one commodity that they needed. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, we keep picking on the Jews. Um, can't we feel a little sorry for them in a way? Because, I mean, weren't they told to, to separate themselves from the world around them? Weren't they told to, you know, not be contaminated? And they were told not to be contaminated, yes. But they were... Not so much to be not be contaminated from from the from the from the Gentiles around them, but they were told not to adopt their religious practices. Specifically, that's what they were told: do not adopt their religious practices. Well, I know, but when you you know you immerse yourself in a culture, it's pretty hard to keep from picking up a lot of bad habits and things. Yeah. So, and that's the problem because that's exactly what they did. They picked up a lot of bad habits. So, <laughs> how does we're now talking about the church in 2012, maybe down the line. How do we get out there in the world and convince the world that we have something they need without being contaminated by it? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people, uh, what's the old saying? Uh, better honey than vinegar <laughs> to catch yeah. people. So... Again, it's love and it's a smile, it's a kind word, it's not condemnation, it's not, you know, in anger you're going to hell screaming at someone. Mm -hmm. It's more like uh, telling them about God and His love and His patience, His enduring grace to us. Okay. There's one thing that comes up that I think is, is, is kind of interesting. Um, his words to the woman had aroused her conscience. Jesus rejoiced. He saw her drinking the water of life, and his own hunger and thirst were satisfied. Mm -hmm. He hadn't, drinking of the, hadn't taken of the water, and he hadn't eaten of the food that they brought, mm -hmm. that the disciples brought to him. The accomplishment of the mi mission, which he had left heaven to perform, <coughs> strengthened the Savior for his labor and lifted him above the necessities of humanity. Mm -hmm. To minister to a soul hungering and thirsting for the truth was more grateful to him than eating or drinking. It was a comfort, a refreshment to him. Benevolence was the life of his soul. Yes. And how much uh, we, can, um, we can bring happiness and we can 
reinvigorate his spirit when we respond as this woman did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Heaven rejoices more over one person who comes back to God than over 99 so-called righteous people who don't need any repentance. But is that also an essay on what our life should be? Yeah. Should we, should we get the same kind of joy and pleasure and out of working for others that Jesus did? Yeah. Well, we know the result was he preached for three or four days to that whole village and many of them became Christians. And they said, you know, we don't need to the woman. They said, we, we don't need to, to believe because of what you've said anymore. Now we, we, we've seen it for ourselves. Yeah. She said, come and see. Now they'd seen and Jesus went on his merry way to Nazareth. So here are, hometown. The, hometown. Here are the disciples in town trying to, well, ought to be discipling in there. And this little lady runs back in there and, and does more uh, preaching exactly. with her <laughs> actions and her message than these guys were. Yep, exactly. I'd like to go next to John 5. John 5 is now the next Passover. We've now gone through a whole year of Christ's ministry in Judea. That's just, there's a couple of other little things we skipped over, but basically we're at the next Passover, okay? In, in these first five chapters, we've gone through From one chapter whole year. two to five, we went through a whole year, yes. Okay? The healing out the pool. After this, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a religious festival. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there's a pool with five porches. In Hebrew, it's called, now you may have Bethsaida. My version says Bethsatha. Um, we're not sure exactly what that pool is called. Of course called. I, what I can tell you is if you go to Jerusalem, you can go not far from the Temple Mount. It's well, the, what's called the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. A short distance from that, and pay a small fee to go in and go down quite a ways, and there's that pool. It's still there. It's still there. It has, still has water in it. At least I, as far as I know, it did when I was there. And um, does, it, does it ripple? I didn't wait for the rippling. I'm not sure <laughs> if it still ripples or not. Well, the man was there who'd been sick for how long? 38, 38 years. years. Crippled. He was about on the, his, his last leg. He was ready to die. And he sat there beside the water. And why was he sitting there behi beside the water? Because he was hoping to get to the water first when it ripped. Why? Because there was a tradition that said that the first person in after the water ripples is healed. But my Bible doesn't have anything about that here. Look in the footnote. The footnote? Why is it in the footnote? Because it wasn't in most of the originals. It wasn't in the originals. It wasn't in the early manuscripts. There's a no footnote in my Bible says they were waiting for the water to move because every now and then an angel of the Lord went down into the pool and stirred up the water. The first sick person to go into the pool after the water was stirred up was healed from whatever disease he had. And in some versions that's verse 3 and 4. Yeah, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4. Uh, how did that get into the King James Version? It's right there in the King James Version. How could that possibly have gotten into the King James Version? Inspiration. Now, why did my version take it out then? Inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to do better than that. Yes. <laughs> it's a long story. It's a long story. It doesn't need to be a long story. It's a story. long story. <laughs> it, do it doesn't need to be a long story. The short version is that um, that was their tradition. That's mm -hmm. what they thought. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Someone trying to explain it later, a manuscript writer later, probably put it in the margin. And subsequent people who copied that said, oh, that explains it. And mm -hmm. so they kept it in there. Yeah, put it in part of the text, yeah. yes. Well, and that, otherwise the rest of the story doesn't make any sense. If you know, if you know why people are gathered there, then fine. You don't need the last part of verse 3 and verse 4. If, you, if you're a Jew and you know all that stuff, no problem. If you're not, if you don't know the situation with Jerusalem, or you don't know why people are at that pool, the rest of the story is, well, you know, why are all these sick people s sitting around this pool? It doesn't make any sense. But then, they, and so the question is, what happened? I think Gordon probably has the very, very plausible explanation that we just heard. 
So what about that? Is it, uh, is it all right to add to the scripture words that weren't there in the original? Well, Boy, a lot of preachers it. do it in their sermons just because... We don't have any original, so we're guessing. <coughs> well, th in Very all of the case. earliest manuscripts, it's missing. Does the explanation of uh, adding, if you had verses, the latter part of verse 3 and, the, verse, and verse 4, does that make look, God look good? Okay, well, here's the question then. Did God tell them to gather around this pool? No. Did God have anything to do with the gathering of the, around the pool? No. Was this an angel who actually came down and stirred the waters? No. Maybe an evil angel. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, possibly. <clears throat> but why did they believe that people got healed by, by getting in? Like the people who believe a lot of superstitions. Placebo effect. Well, who would be the quickest one to get in? The healthiest, the healthiest ones. The healthiest ones, the guys who probably not, maybe has a psychological problem or something like this, and he gets in first. Because, I mean, the guy who's paralyzed for 38 years, how long is it going to take him to get into the water? So Jesus comes along on a Sabbath afternoon. He's walking alone to the area, and he heads to this pool. And now he could have come on Friday. He knew about this man. He could have come on Sunday or any other day of the week. But he came on Sabbath. Always trying to create trouble. <laughs> <laughs> always, always trying to create trouble. Yeah. So what did he do? Stirring up the hornet's nest. He came down to the man. He said, would you like to be well? Now, you know, I, God has a fantastic sense of humor. I, I just love so many stories in the Bible. When you understand what's going on behind the scenes especially, would you like to be well? Uh, no, I'm not. I think I'd like to stay right here, right? I like this misery. <laughs> the man says, well, what do I need to do? And Jesus basically says, uh, get up and take up your mat and walk. Now, he could, Jesus knew perfectly well. He knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't have to tell the man to pick up. The, if the guy had gotten up and left and stored his mat beside the pool somewhere, so I'll come back after Sabbath and pick it up, there would have been no problem. Nobody else was allowed to carry the mat on Sabbath either, right? But what did Jesus say to the man? Pick, Pick up it. your mat. Pick it up. Take it home, right? And what happened? The authorities caught him. The authorities, yes. They saw him. And what was he? The terrible thing he was doing, he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And what, what happened? I think they recognized him <clears throat> as the guy who had been at the pool for 38 years. I'm sure some did. Probably all of them. What does this rabble-rousing episode have to say about God? Well, let's think about that. That's, that's the question. What is God trying to do here? Trying to change their idea about the Sabbath. He's trying to change their idea about lots of things. <clears throat> He's trying to correct their observance of the Sabbath, that's for sure. That's for sure. What else do you think he was trying to say? He's now for the, well, this is maybe the second or third time that we know about. I mean, there are probably other times, but the second or third time that we know about that he takes a person who has been sick for many, many, many years. There's no one, do you think anyone at the pool there or any of the authorities who knew about this man, did any of them have any question about whether or not this man was sick? That he had a problem. No. No. And they knew why. Because and he was a sinner. He was a sinner. It's sinners that suffer. Only sinners have this kind of problem. This guy's a terrible sinner, okay, by their way of thinking. And now he's jumping and leaping and carrying and his mat. What do you mean by that? What? What? They, well, had, they had this perception. The that, Jews you believed know, that if you were good, then God would bless you. And, of course, God blessing you means a what? You're healthy. You're healthy, wealthy, wealthy. healthy, and wealthy. What do they call that in today's language? Healthy, wealthy. Prosperity theology. The there you go. Prosperity theology. Yeah. <coughs> exactly. Christ dealt with that, didn't he? He said, yeah. don't sin anymore unless something worse happens to you. So he yeah. was well aware of what was Exactly. You know, it sure seems like I recall hearing that kind of theology on some of these televangelists. Really? Amazing. But isn't it true? I mean, won't God bless you? Well, usually... I thought the, 
I thought the Bible was quite clear about that, that if you were righteous, then you, your life was blessed. And I think People want to believe that. Well, usually with that <laughs> prosperity theology, you have to send them some money in order to kickstart it. It's like priming the well. <laughs> you send them the money, and then you get the blessing. You don't send the money, they, you're on your own, well, according to them. Sometimes if you're sick, for example, you can send in a handkerchief and they'll, with well, your contrib your generous contribution, and they'll... There's been some who just basically say, you know, if you're good, God blesses you. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the oldest philosophy there was, isn't it? Uh, I'll joke her back to Job. So, if the devil could fashion you in your misbelief, mm -hmm. would he bring prosperity to you? Well, a good question. If he could, maybe, uh, which he could, I presume, and I'm sure he does in some cases. So where does, where does prosperity come from? I mean, if it just happenstance, just, well, here um, it's happening and you just happen to be the guy there? I, I, I want to draw some conclusions just because we're running out of time. What did the Pharisees do when they questioned this man? <clears throat> Men didn't know who it was that had healed him. They wanted to know who did it. Now, how many people do you think were wandering around Jerusalem that day who could have healed that man? Did the Pharisees know absolutely for sure that there was only one person who could have done that? Sure. Of course they did. And they were looking for a chance to accuse Jesus of breaking the law. And what they were going to do is they were going to say, okay, who has the authority? And Jesus, if you read the rest of chapter 5, Jesus challenges their authority. He says, who has the authority? I have authority to command sickness. I have, a command, I have authority, he's going to say later, to command death. I have authority to command all kinds of things. What can you do? So who has the real authority? And Jesus is telling us God has the power to reach into our lives and do something for us. The devil will do everything possible to mess us up in our thinking, etc. But he has no power to really make a change unless we agree to it. God wants to touch every one of us. And I hope that will happen to you this week. See you next week.